McQuistian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future, Well, welcome. I'm Dennis McQuistion, and welcome to a program all about the storm before the calm. And yes, we have that right. And it's with Dr. George Friedman, a program we did recently. And my co-host then, as now, is none other than Jim Falk. He is the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And Jim, uh, you and George and I obviously go back a long way. Why don't you give that viewer an indication of who George Friedman is and what we're going to talk about, and maybe a little recap of what that other program was about to set the stage. Absolutely. Good to see you, Dennis. And George, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for coming with us in a virtual way from Austin, Texas, your home. Uh, I think many people indeed know that George Friedman is an internationally recognized geo, uh, geopolitical forecaster. He's the founder of Geopolitical uh, Futures, a remarkable firm. And I encourage everyone to go to his website and you'll enjoy very much the bulletins that he puts out nearly every day. His most recent book is Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s, and The Triumph Beyond. It was published just a few months ago, uh, this, this past February. And in it, he describes how the United States periodically reaches a point of crisis in which it appears to be at war with itself. That's a little discouraging idea, George, but talk with us about these cycles that really uh, lay, are the foundation of your book. Well, there are two sets of cycles. One is the institutional cycle. It basically changes every 80 years. I don't know why, but it does. And then there's the social and economic cycle, which every 50 years changes. Again, I don't know why, but it does. The last change was when the 70s ended, bad time, Ronald Reagan took over, and we entered another period of growth and development that was extraordinary. Now that 50 years is over, Things have gone to extreme, and we're having the kind of crisis now that we had in the 1960s. The anger of all parts, particularly over race, is ripping the country, and this is the process we go through. George, you, you talk a lot in your book about a president, and yet you, you say in some ways, I think, that they don't make a lot of difference. They, the sort of the times make them as opposed to them making the times. But you talked about Reagan and there are others in the past, but obviously we've had since 2016 uh, an unusual president to say the least. And the things that brought him uh, to the presidency and then uh, talk about that. And then this idea that you have about there was no power to get him elected, but no power to actually make changes or make things effective. Uh, help us with that. Well, in the first place, the last cycle began with Richard Nixon, who didn't get impeached, well, <laughs> essentially because he resigned. And certainly, you'd have to say he was a criminal. So we begin with eating up presidents at a certain point. Ronald Reagan won, won the presidency because he spoke for the vast majority of Americans who were displaced by the radical changes that take place, taking place. Uh, the decline of industrialism, uh, the decline of any number of trading patterns, and he came to power. But like Gerald Ford, he wasn't quite sure what to do. He has a different personality than Gerald Ford. It's different, but he desperately understood that there was a crisis. He couldn't quite define it, and he certainly couldn't solve it. It was too early for that. So what we had here is a man who represented a class that felt aggrieved, uh, middle western uh, industrial workers who still believed from their Baptist or Catholic churches, the teachings they had were called deplorable by Hillary Clinton, uh, he spoke for them, but he couldn't do for them, not yet. This takes time to work through. Well, you know, we're four months away from a presidential election. 
what difference will it make any difference who is president insofar as you discuss these cycles that we are about to perhaps experience? We're very interesting because I think of presidents of kings and kings who will make very great decisions. The American president is the weakest president of the Euro-American world, the weakest leader. He has two parliaments, not one to deal with. A court system where some judge in Hawaii can decide that he can't do what he wanted to do. And we expect miracles from him. He is riding the storm. He is trying to keep some balance. He's trying to do some good. But first, we have to work through the crisis that, that appeared. We have to find a new technology. We have to deal with race. We have endless things to do. And we have this illusion that if only he were a nice guy, this president would be able to do these things. That you'd want to go have a beer with him. <laughs> Definitely have beer with him. It was very interesting that Walter Lippmann, I mentioned this before, that Walter Lippmann regarded Franklin Roosevelt as one of the stupidest lightweights he'd ever seen. And just before the election, he said, it's a calamity for the Democrats to nominate him. So our ability to have contempt for presidents and expect miracles from them is just amazing. When we're talking about miracles, everyone's hoping that there'll be a vaccine for COVID-19 very, very quickly. But before we even consider that, how did we get into this situation? Why were we not better prepared? Well, essentially because God brings various diseases on us and he fools us every time. You know, the experts are saying we would have a pandemic. When? How? What? This they didn't get to. Here's the problem we have. There's a normal pattern for medical research, and it works, and it's good, but it takes time. There is no emergency method for doing it. The goal of doctors is first do no harm. Commander will tell you the goal is you know, careful risks. And they won't take risks. And so they'll give us a solution. But the time it takes will cost us a great deal in terms not only of lives, but of the economy. George, you um, obviously talking about the virus and we're talking about Trump, but um, those things uh, seem to me, based upon what I read in your book, to pale in comparison with events that you think are going to take place between 2020 and 2030, that storm that you talk about before the calm. Tell us what you see then and how important perhaps the person who's elected 2024 or 2028 may be uh, due to nothing of their own fault or nothing that they've ever done right, as the case may be. The federal government doesn't work. It's not that it can't do anything, send out checks and stuff like that. But even when you have to send out checks, they have to take how long to do it. The federal government has grown large, complex, filled with experts, but no common sense. It used to be that a good lawyer could become a cabinet minister, cabinet uh, member, I should say, in the United States. Uh, they're not there anymore. And then we had one huge problem, which is the primary system. Now, the primary system on the surface is really great. We'll all vote and pick the candidates. But only 15, 10 percent people vote because politics at this point is not that important in America. And so really strange people emerge as candidates and as a process. And there's no one there to really speak to the government. There's no ombudsman, which is used to be party bosses. You called him up and he said, I'm having a problem with Social Security, and he'd make a call and you'd vote for him, and that was it. This is called corruption. But this is the system the federal government was founded on. This is what the founders wanted. There's, in the First Amendment, there is a right to petition the government. That right has been lost. You cannot find a place in the government where you can actually petition them and get an answer. They're very nice people working for the federal government. They really wish they could do something for you. But you cannot petition the government. It's a violation of the First Amendment. So one of the things we're going to have is an upheaval internally in how the federal government works. There are two things that are needed. The political 
system has to be able to access the government without going to jail on behalf of their constituents. And resting above the experts, they have to be people who have common sense. Common sense is not something you can easily define. But like other things, you can recognize it when you see it. It is the ability to sit there and say, this is really stupid. It won't work. And have three experts get together and solve the problem. But also they can do something else. They can say, this is not a problem that the federal government can solve. And we've lost that ability. No one after the last cycle since World War II will say, this is something the federal government can't solve or better yet, shouldn't solve. <laughs> okay. So we have to restructure as we did after Ronald Reagan became president, as we did when, after Roosevelt became president. We have to restructure the political system in fundamental ways, and there will be blood. I don't necessarily mean real blood. I simply mean, boy, is it going to be loud. You know, George, when you look at countries that have been successful in dealing with the virus, as, as well as other matters, um, global issues, they've been democracies, but they've been new democracies. Is there an, is, is, is an issue that countries like the United States and the UK that are hundreds of years old, that they don't have the responsiveness that you might see with younger countries? It's partly that. It is also that many of these younger countries are former dictatorships. And being former dictatorships, there is a sense of obedience. Hmm. The United States is a land of cowboys. Do not fence me in. I don't care if I'm going to die of a disease. I'm not going to wear that mask. We have a culture that properly is suspicious of government. It is suspicious of the state, and it's frequently is right. They're doing stupid things. Sometimes they're wrong. But American culture is extremely different. So when Poland solves a problem, well, everybody's worried in the middle of the night they're going to come and be taken away. In the United States, it's different. Well, certainly we've become a democracy, but more than that, we've become a technocracy. The decisions about our life are made by people we've never met, don't know whether to trust and can change the world. Dr. Fauci is a, a great guy. I, got, I don't want to pretend, but where did he come from? <laughs> Who made him spokesman for anything? Uh, he doesn't have to prove himself to the public. He has to prove himself to the politicians. So we have a problem, which is that we're a vast country. We have all sorts of solutions, problems that need solutions. And we have... You know, no system of making proportionate decisions, okay? Healthcare was not one example. The way we handled COVID was another example. The president is not supposed to be handling this. That's not a federal issue. That's a state issue. The state issue is supposed to do the best he can. We have no sense of proportion. I'm not worried about that we're not a republic nearly as much as I'm worried of faceless people making vast decisions that can't be appealed. Um, the size of government, you don't, you're not as concerned about as I am. You look at the number of people working for them. I look at the amount of money they spend, which is huge on everything, which is also huge. Um, a guy I know, an economist has predicted 10 years ago that the meltdown would happen in 2026 because it's the Federal Reserve uh, cycle on money. That's one of the issues. But you talk about that the federal government doesn't work. And I think most people would agree with that. You look at the um, polls and about 19% or 17% believe the federal government does the right thing. What are you proposing needs to be done in this time of storm in order to get us to the calm? Well, firstly, we need a president who runs on a platform that I'm not gonna promise you anything. I'm gonna do the best I can, but most of these things are beyond my confidence and won't happen. And he's going to take a cabinet who actually will function as the cabinet the founders ima imagined. Instead of, yeah, they're the cabinet, but nobody pays attention to them. It's three stories down. that They will, he, they will be a cabinet, and they will be held responsible. And they will become modest. They will become modest not because 
They want to be, but because the public turns on the government, the public finally turns in the 2020s on the government and said, look, if you're going to do something, do it well. If you can't do it well, don't do it. And by the way, could you please tell me what the board of the Federal Reserve does and who they are and how they got appointed? <laughs> this change comes from the public. We have to stand up and not make absurd par- you know, fantasies and you know, conspiracy theories. Everything. And simply ask a simple question. Who made you God? Well, part of it too, George, is that it's really been the dumbing down of the communication that comes from the government. Well, but I think people distrust the government so deeply, they know this is nonsense. They're not fooling anybody anymore. There was a time, I mean, the, the time of Eisenhower was great. He could make a speech that no one understood because he didn't want anybody to understand it. Everybody kind of imitated him thereafter. But we've reached a point where no one has any trust that the federal government even knows what it's doing. So it's not even a lie, it's just confusion. Well, would you not say also one of the problems is is that Congress, the legislative branch, has really refused to take any responsibility. Uh, certainly you've seen that in Afghanistan and Iraq and other instances. Um, you know, everybody's thinking about the next election. And how do you, how do you change that? Well, only the electorate can and will. So the, the proper answer is you don't vote for those people anymore. But look, we had an incredible political crisis after Roosevelt. And I remember when Reagan was elected, everybody thinks it was smooth. He was considered an idiot, a halfwit. Uh, you know, all of you know the Democrats were opposed to him and everything else. This is how we play. We go through this period. One of the things that Reagan did was he just did what he had to do, and he didn't care what anybody said. Being indifferent helped. Roosevelt also had this enormous ability to be indifferent to anybody else's opinion. We need a president who doesn't care very much what people say, but doesn't show it. Let me, let me ask you about this factor that you write about quite a bit in the book, and you've written about it in your other books as well, and and we all know it is a factor, and that's demographics. Uh, so talk to us about the birth rate on one side and the longevity issue on the other. And George, I'm hoping for the three of us that the longevity issue you talk about is accurate, but it has the implications. Well, all technology solves problems. The automobile solved a set of problems. Electricity solved problems. What is our problem now? Our problem is that we're living longer and longer. And the millennials, for reasons I can't quite comprehend, don't reproduce nearly as much. In around 20 years, there's going to be a lot more old guys, gals, wandering around aimlessly compared to them. Now, if we don't solve the fundamental diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, these – remember, we soak up most of the money of our medical life in the last year. Unless we do something to transform that, well, the taxpayers are fewer. We can't do this. So there is going to be a medical assault on these diseases. But it also changes the way the country works. Up until now, we've worshipped youth. Up until now, we've looked for wisdom from 19-year-olds. In a great sense, we're going to have the first civilization – where the elderly have the political upper hand, not the younger ones. We're, we're not ready for that. We haven't Elaborate on that, that George. Come. George, it's elaborate great. on that. Well, if we live to the age, we're now living on average to 80. And if you're 70 years old, you'll probably live to 85. And we're pushing 90 on various numbers, and that means we're going to live longer. That means we're going to soak up medical problems, uh, medical costs, if you will, at a fantastic rate. The younger ones, the uh, millennials, aren't having babies. So in 20 years, they're not going to be there to pay taxes. On the other hand, they're not going to get to win elections because we'll continue to make them. So we are entering a period of time 
that has, in my knowledge, never once outside of mass murder and war ever existed. Well, I don't think my children have, have heard this because I have five young grandchildren now. <laughs> so they're, they're doing their share. You know, since the outbreak of the virus and even before then, there have been so many obituaries lamenting the passing of globalization. And it reminds me of what Mark Twain said about his own obituary, that the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. What do you think is the prospect for globalization from the, from the United States viewpoint first and then more at, at large? If you think about globalization, that's been going on since the 15th century. Ever since the Spaniards came and stole the loot from the Aztecs and the Incas and went back and built empires based on that, that was globalization. We've been trading with the world with the Silk Road for a long time. They don't mean that by globalization. They mean, are we going to have systems without any tariffs? And are we going to join multinational organizations? Well, you take a look at the EU and this crisis, and you will find many reasons why multinational organizations aren't the best idea. As to tariffs, well, they have to be equitable. You know, China was blocking at American trade. It happens. The answer is we will have, you know, globalization will be there, but it will take different forms. It always does. People who are advocates of globalization say, let's keep exactly what we built in 1952 and not change it at all. We're going beyond that. And I recently interviewed uh, Robert Gates about his new book, and he stresses throughout the book that you need to reform the State Department. And as you've indicated, government is broken. But how do you break through to really get these fundamental changes? Well, these transitional presidents... Rutherford B. Hayes was one. He introduced the gold standard that drove the Industrial Revolution tremendously. Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jackson may create the financial system that made the settlement of the West possible. How do these guys do this? By being SOBs. They weren't nice people. They pretended to be nice people, but they were ruthless. They understood the moment and they acted. Roosevelt was a man like that. Ronald Reagan was a man like that. These are guys who have a vision of what they want to create. The vision makes sense. And they run over people who are simply, what should I call? Uh, simply in it for the job. I may not have understood you correctly, but did you say that we cannot expect to have a transitional president until 2028? And if that's the I, case, why not? I, by models, okay, this transition takes place. Richard Nixon was, you'll pardon me, called the Donald Trump of our time, okay? We then, after Richard Nixon, went to Gerald Ford, who was a very nice man. Then we got to Jimmy Carter, also a nice man, I guess. I didn't think so, but okay, he's a nice man. And he did all the things that Roosevelt would have done. We were living in a world of incredible inflation rates, unbelievable interest rates, and he wanted to cut taxes on the wealthy so that the middle class, the problem we had was that there was not enough investment capital. It had been sucked up in purchasing and credit cards and everything like that. And so he kept doing the things that he thought should work. They didn't work and along came Ronald Reagan who nobody was sure knew what to do, but at least he wasn't Carter. It takes time for this crisis. Right now, we're sitting here saying the same thing we said in 68. This is an extraordinary crisis. It will never end. It transforms America, rioting in every city. As time goes on, the storm calms. You finally realize we've got to change the way we're doing things. And George, the problem is time is going on. We only have a couple of minutes left. And I want you to tell quickly what that, tell that viewer what he or she should do for heaven's sake. Well, he's going to come into power and he's going to gut the federal government. Or she. He, or it may well be she. And I'll, I'll welcome that and that's fine. Uh, he or she is going to come in and they're going to cut, gut the federal government. The way Reagan restructured it, the way Roosevelt rejiggered it. They always do that. 
And secondly, they will recognize that in this period of time, our fundamental problem is that money has no value. In other words, interest rates are so low, we have so much surplus capital out of the success of the Reagan era that we can't keep doing the Reagan era. And there's going to be a change in the tax code. We always play the tax code one way or the other. And this person, I suspect, will recognize that to maintain their political power, they will have to break the back of the congressional parties. It's going to have to do that. And that's been done before without filing the Constitution. So it's going to be a person who grasps the problem we have. Our, our, we have no new technology. The microchip is 50 years old, the same age as the auto bill was in 1965. Uh, this is not new. We're just going to have more car you know, games and stuff like that. He's going to recognize the need for more investment capital when nobody's willing to invest at these interest rates. Right. And this changed your world. Well, George, uh, this is a good way to conclude the program, and we'll also encourage people to read your book to get even more information, because one of the things you talked about in the book is you said that what's driven America is our Constitution and our rights, um, and that's really driven the American experience. Uh, one characterized, as some would say, by chaos and chaos and stability. So I think we should conclude with a hope and belief that tomorrow brings calmer seas to our shores. Um, thank you, uh, George, for being with us, and thank you to all of you for inviting Dennis and me into your homes to talk about things that matter with people who care. And please remember to follow us on LinkedIn, and to catch up on programs that you might have missed, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, McQuiston TV. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email Nikki N at NikkiMcQuestion.com. Visit our website at www.McQuestionTV.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash TV or download McQuestion TV video podcast on iTunes.